Amen. Let's give the Lord another round of applause if we could this morning. Man, what truth. Well, we welcome you this morning. I'm excited about uh, this message this morning. I shared with you guys two weeks ago as we were doing uh, our time around the Lord's table. Uh, as I was working through kind of Genesis to Exodus, getting to, to the Passover, kind of the context of the Lord's Supper, you know, again, the Lord just paused me in the story of Joseph. Joseph has meant uh, a lot to me over the years, the story of Joseph in Genesis. And so I really felt the Lord taking me back there. This was kind of an in-between week. Uh, last week was Group Link. I want to thank so many of you who headed out uh, with the incentive of the bunt cake, but hopefully you got a, a bunt cake uh, last Sunday morning. All the hard work of our staff and, and pastors, they did a great job. Rachel did a, a great job. And so thank you for your willingness to, to step out there. And so we knew that there was this, this one weekend, because next weekend we're beginning a new series entitled Promises as we work through. Uh, six weeks of assurances of God's word, different things that God has absolutely given to us, black and white. And so this was a Sunday that I was really just kind of like, okay, Lord, where do you want me to go? And had no idea three weeks ago that this would be where we landed, but I'm excited uh, to share some personal things uh, that the Lord has done in my life through this story and to also dig into it. So if you would take your Bibles with me this morning, turn with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis uh, we'll go to 39. The story actually begins in 37, and we'll back up to there in just a little while, but we're going to begin in 39. But if you're new here, uh, my name's uh, Heath Burris. I'm the senior pastor here, and I am known uh, for my great joke telling around. <laughs> See, y'all got to at least, like, not give it up that quick. Like, if someone's first time, they may actually think I'm saying something true, and y'all just blew it for me. Well, I've always said that, you know, to you guys, I need all the help I can get, so if you ever have anything send it my way, and, and I will reiterate that. But someone did this past week, and I have a rule that if I laugh out loud when I read it, I'm going to share it with, with, you know, some grain of salt there. But if I laugh out loud, and so the guy, one of our faithful members sent me this joke. Reminds me of a story. I don't know why it reminds me of a story. That's always my lead in. The guy bought the world's worst thesaurus. Not only thesaurus, you know what a thesaurus is, it's not the joke yet, a thesaurus, 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 the joke is my mispronunciation of thesaurus. How do you say it? Thesaurus, thesaurus, pecan, pecan, whatever, thesaurus, right? So the guy, not only, not, it was the worst thesaurus ever, not only was it terrible, it was terrible. So he takes it back, and they give him blank pages. And there are no words to describe how that made him feel. <laughs> I guess it wasn't that good. So that doesn't fall on me, and I'm not going to share his name. All right, Genesis 37, if you would. I thought it was funny, and I won't make it to 1115, but I thought it was funny. This story, man, this story means so much. You know, again, the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God. I believe every Sunday is a divine appointment. I believe that. That if you're here, no matter how you got here, whether it's your first or thousandth time, I believe that God has preordained for us to be. I don't believe in anything random. I don't believe in a coincidence. I just don't. I don't believe it. I believe as you look into God's word, yes, there's free will, and we have the ability to make decisions, good decisions, bad decisions, faithful decisions, unfaithful decisions, but God is sovereign over it all, and he works in the midst of it all. And so I believe that God's led us here today for this story. There are some of you here today, I believe, that can relate to the story of Joseph. There are some of you here today who walked in with a lot of stuff upon your shoulders. It may be the most chaotic time of your life. It may be a dark storm in your life. And it may be not just weeks, months. We may be talking about years. And I pray what happens this morning is through the story of Joseph, through the blood of Jesus, that you're encouraged. Because the promises that we have in this story are for all those who know Christ as their Lord and Savior. That there's victory in the midst of these valleys that we walk through. So I remember as a kid, this was one of the stories that always I loved. I loved the story of Joseph of being kind of the punk younger brother. I have a brother that's six years older than I am. So the story of Joseph resonated with me. Again, one of the younger brothers, he was not liked by his older brothers. I believe my brother loves me and loved me, but he didn't always like me. And so I related to the story of Joseph that here was this young guy, 17 years old, that again, right away, uh, is not the, the greatest picture isn't painted of him. He's kind of prideful in some ways. That God gives him these visions, God gives him these dreams, but he doesn't hold it within. He begins to share it with his brothers who are already struggling with envy and jealousy because there was reason for it, right? The Bible tells us that he was the son of his father's old age. 
the, the 11th of the 12th, Benjamin being the 12th, but he was one of the younger sons. And so there was favoritism, which is unique to me when you really think about Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, right? Jacob is the one who was robbed of the blessing, if you remember, right? And so here he is, or he was one who deceived his father. So now his own sons deceive him. It's an interesting story of how it all plays out where he sends him out to the brothers, right? You know the story, the coat of many, of many colors. I love that story as a kid growing up in the mid-80s. I thought that meant a neon-colored jacket. Like, that's what I thought that meant, like a coat of many colors. This dude had a sweet neon jacket. I don't think that's the picture of it in the Bible, but that's what I saw in my Precious Moments Bible. So as a kid growing up, this was my story. The brother said, hey, we got to get rid of this guy, right? I mean, he's our father's favorite, and the father is showing favoritism to him. Let's get rid of him. Someone suggested, let's kill him which I'm sure my brother thought about that a couple of times to his younger brother. And Reuben steps in, no, no, let's not kill him, but let's throw him in a pit, right? That's a better alternative. Let's not kill him, but let's throw him into a pit. And then let's go tell father that he was eaten by a wild animal. The story, right? He takes the coat of many colors. They kill the ram. They dip it in blood. They go home. They say, dad, your baby's gone. That's my interpretation of it. Your baby's gone. And you know the story, obviously, the mourning and the heartbreak of the father of one of his youngest sons. The story is what? They throw him into a pit, and that a caravan traveling to Egypt, you want to see the sovereignty of God, the caravan traveling to Egypt comes by, they sell him into slavery, 20 shekels of silver. Roughly, it's hard to translate, $15, $20, they sold their brother into slavery. The Bible tells us that what? He's, 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 He's taken into all these different types of scenes, and every scene that he's in, he's faithful to God. Even though every time, it's like every time he takes one step forward, he gets knocked back three. Placed into Potiphar's house, right, because of his faithfulness, God continues to bless him, prosper him. He's given authority in that home. The Bible describes him as a handsome young man in which Potiphar's wife catches an eye for him, tries to seduce him. He runs, he flees, right? She grabs the garment. If you remember the story, Potiphar comes home and she says, this Hebrew boy, there's a slang term there that is used, this Hebrew young boy tried to rape me. He's thrown into prison. 13 years, right? The, the story begins at 17. And he doesn't stand before Pharaoh until 30 for 13 years, not for doing the wrong thing, but for doing the right thing. And I remember years ago, right? It was 2002. It was spring of 2002. I just surrendered to go into ministry, and, and I was getting ready to start my spring semester at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And my dad was like, hey, uh, would you and Spanky, Spanky, my cousin from Spartanburg, who's a pastor today as well, he's actually a college professor so they call him Dr. Spanky. Anyway, so my cousin Spanky came up, and so my dad was like, come with us to PTI. Now, some of you guys may think, pardon the interruption. That's not what it stood for then. It was Pastors Training Institute, led by, led by someone by the name of Dr. Adrian. Fill it in with me, Dr. Adrian. Rogers. Okay, one of the heroes of, of my faith. Again, I, my dad, again, it, it's probably my dad's favorite uh, pastor that he's ever had in his life. A lot of it because when my dad was in seminary in the early 80s, it was before the transition and the resurgence of, 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 of really, you know, it, it had gone liberal. My dad would tell stories that he would sit in a New Testament class and a professor stood before them and said, if you believe in the virgin birth, you're an idiot. That's the setting that he was in, in seminary in the early 80s. Obviously, the Lord had a, did a, quite the transition. There was a different seminary that I attended 20 years later. But what my dad would have to do is he'd have to counter that bad theology. He'd go home and listen to tapes, uh, audio tapes of Dr. Adrian Rogers. Now, to our young people, tapes are these things that used to... Anyway, so he would have thousands upon thousands of tapes. And so this was, again, he would say that his training really came under Dr. Adrian Rogers. So it was quite a treat. Pastor's Training Institute, 40 young men, well, not young men. It was all types of ages and different seasons of of ministry. My dad and Spanky and I went to the Pastor's Training Institute. We sat in a room, and I'm getting ready just to begin my first semester, scared to death of the unknown, scared to death of what does this mean in the days and weeks to come. Have you ever been there? Are some of you there today? And a young man raised his hand. What was so amazing about this, Dr. Adrian Rogers really allowed for anybody just to ask any questions that they want. You had guys in there who were broken. You had guys in there who were burdened. You had guys in there who, had, who were losing their marriage, guys in there who were losing their ministry. And they began to just ask Dr. Adrian Rogers questions, personal questions. And one of the statements, that, or one of the questions came out was, Dr. Adrian Rogers, what's one of your favorite stories of the Bible? And if you've ever heard him talk, he's got that deep radio voice, and he went to Genesis, and he said, young men or men, take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis. So take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis. I'm going to invite you to stand with me this morning. This is what we're going to do. We're going to walk through this story. As we sat there in that scene, Dr. Adrian Roderick gave us three Ps, and I'm not going to touch it. There's three Ps. It's an alliterated outline. It's something I wrote in my Bible as I was sitting there, what was that, 19, 18 years ago. 
Oh, Lord have mercy. All right, here we go. Genesis 37. The story of Joseph is what? God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. The Bible tells us that the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. And so it was all part of God's plan, even in the tough things, even in the valleys, even in the storms. God was doing things in his life, as you know, eventually to raise him up to be second in charge of all of Egypt. And there would come a time where those same brothers, if you remember, that sold him into slavery are now standing before him. They don't know who he is, and he doesn't reveal who he is. And you see such a picture of grace, such a picture of redemption, such a picture of forgiveness, such a picture of Jesus is what you see in an Old Testament story of Joseph. The title of the message this morning is Faithful. Let's just read chapter 39. We're going to jump all over the place this morning, but let's go here first, and let's read verses 19 down to verse 23. Now, this picks up after he's been falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and I want you to notice the repeated phrases that you find just as the story unfolds. It says this in verse 19 of Genesis 39. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife had spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this matter, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. Now, notice the beginning of verse 21, repeated phrase. But the Lord was, say it with me, was with Joseph but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison whatever they did there it was his doing the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because why the Lord was with him and whatever he did the Lord made it prosper join with me as we go to Lord in prayer Heavenly Father Well, we come before you, Lord, first and foremost, Lord, thanking you for the victory that is found alone in the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that as we are gathered here, Lord, under the cross, Lord, we thank you for uh, the redemption, the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy that has been shown to us uh, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, that is the message that needs to be heard today more than anything, that these promises that we have in Scripture come to those who know you. So, Lord, I pray if there's one here today who has never called upon the name of Jesus, turned from their sins and surrendered their heart and life, may today be the beginning of that journey. For the rest who are on that journey, Lord, your word tells us that you are faithful to complete the work that you've begun. And, Lord, we don't always understand the work, we don't always like the work, and we don't always get it. So, Lord, we pray that you will sustain us, especially as we walk through the valleys, especially as we walk through the storms. And Lord, I know there are many hearing the sound of my voice who find themselves in this type of situation. And so Lord, may the story of Joseph be an encouragement today. And I pray, Lord, fuel for the fire that we, that we may be found faithful in the midst of it. So may the name of Jesus be lifted high. We pray it, we ask it in Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. There were many quotes that Dr. Adrian Rogers made that day. One of the quotes that I wrote down was this. He said, it is a fact of Christian experience that life is a series of valleys and peaks. Speaking specifically to the Christian, he says, in his efforts for the Lord to get permanent possession of the soul, he said, I believe in the authority of God's word that he uses the valleys more than he uses the peaks. And some of his unique vessels have gone through longer and deeper valleys than anyone else. And we see that, right? We see that all throughout Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. We see that sometimes, and sometimes we don't like to say it out loud, that the the ones that God used the most were the ones who went through the most. That many times it were those who went through these different seasons of life that God did unique things in and through them. And of course, Joseph is no different. So I'm going to give you the three Ps. I'm going to give you the three Ps this morning that were given to us 18 years ago that I, my mind has gone to back, back to many times in just these past 18 years. The first one is this. Regardless of the season you find yourself in, regardless of the questions that you have, regardless of the chaos that might be going on around you, what sustains you? First of all, number one, we We must remember the promises of God, the promises of God. And again, let me say up front, all of this comes back to what? Your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. These promises flow to those who know Christ as their Lord and Savior. But I want you to see in the story of Joseph that it's no coincidence that up front in the story, God gives Joseph these visions. God gives Joseph these dreams. Because what do we have as promises? We have the written word of God. We can go and put our eyes, physically touch the promises of God. Now, again, go back 3,000 years ago. There was no written thing for Joseph to look upon. So what did Joseph have? He had God's words that were given to him through these visions and through these dreams. So let's go back and look at these dreams and visions. He didn't handle it the best way, but let's go back and look at the promise that God gives to him right up front. 
Let's go back to chapter 37, the beginning of the story. And we're going to begin reading in verse 5. For some of you, this may be the first time you've seen these two dreams that God gives him. So let's just read through them, verse 5 down to verse 11. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, first mistake. And they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream, which I've dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. Probably not the best thing to tell a bunch of dudes who already don't like you, right? The Bible goes on to say what? And his brothers said to him, shall you you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed still another dream, and he made the mistake again, and he even actually took it further. He told it to his brothers and his father, and he said this, look, I have dreamed another dream, and at this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is the dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and all of your brothers indeed come to bow down to you before the earth? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now, obviously, I think we would all agree. Okay, young 17-year-old boy, I think we could all go back to being 17. Parents, any parents of a 17-year-old? Let me hear you say amen, amen. God's grace upon you guys. Let me just say, anyway, so 17 years old, right? And so probably didn't handle it the best way. Again, a little bit prideful, right? God gives him these visions, gives him these dreams. He takes it right to his brothers and even to his father and says, let me share with you guys what God has told me. He didn't handle it the right way, but what do you find at the beginning of the story? You find at the beginning of the story, God giving this young man a promise. From the very beginning of the story, here is God's word to Joseph. Now again, a little bit different than what we have today. We have God's word to us, Old Testament, New Testament, inspired. Yes, written by human hands, but inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's inerrant, and I believe it's infallible. Infallible. 3,000 years ago, what was Joseph leaning upon? He was leaning upon the words that God had promised him through these dreams and through these visions. And you think about it. He's going to go through a lot of different seasons here. But there was meaning to these visions and to these dreams. Like the first dream, sheaves, is a promise that God would elevate him above the world's resources. That's the first promise. The second dream, stars, that God would elevate him even not only above the world's resources, but above the world's rulers. This was God's promise to Joseph. But I'm sure as he's looking around in that pit, he's going, "Uh, God, did I mishear you? I'm sure that for 13 years in a prison, he was human just like the rest of us. I'm sure there were nights that he went to bed thinking, okay, are these promises really true? Listen, have you ever been there? I know I have. The enemy has a way, especially in those vulnerable seasons, the enemy has a way to lie and to lie specifically on the same situation that God speaks truth in. God speaks truth into our situations that, hey, it's under my authority, that, hey, I'm sovereign over this, that my promises hold you. The enemy counters those lies. No, you're by yourself. God has forsaken you. God doesn't see you. God is not near you. The enemy is saying the exact opposite of what we know to be true in the promises of God word. So I wonder how many nights Joseph went to bed struggling with some of these questions. Okay, God, you've given me these promises, right? But I've been sold into slavery. Uh, I've been thrown into prison, not for doing the wrong thing, but for doing what I thought was honorable and what would bring you glory. I'm trying to walk with you. Ever been there? I'm trying to live for Jesus. I'm trying to give you my life. And it almost seems like I take one step forward and I get knocked flat back. We've all been there. And the enemy loves to work in the gray areas, right? The enemy loves to work in the gray areas. God works in the black and white. God works in truth. The enemy works in the gray areas to take our situations and, again, to try to cast doubt upon him. So practically speaking, what must we do? I believe we have to follow the model of what, even what we see with Joseph. Practically speaking, rather than dwelling upon his problems, dwelling upon his doubts, dwelling upon his questions, what do you find him doing? Dwelling upon the promise. That are given to him. And let's just be real. I'm going to be real with you this morning. That doesn't come natural to any of us. I can stand behind this pulpit week in and week out and preach truth boldly with confidence. It can be a different story on Tuesday morning when I'm wrestling with, okay, Lord, how do the promises that I know to be true and the promises that I preach and the promises that I believe in match up with the chaos of my life, with the questions of my life? 
And you find yourself at a crossroads, right, in those moments, right? You find yourself, and I believe, again, if the, the Bible describes him as a roaring lion, if you ever seen the way lions hunt, I mean, they're very patient. And what do they do? They wait until the prey is vulnerable. They wait until they're weak. They wait until, what, they're, they're tired. They wait until they're sick. They wait until they're separated. And they pounce. And so I wonder how many nights the enemy was trying to cast out upon the promises that Joseph knew to be true. So the first P is that we what? We remember the promises of God, regardless of what you're in, regardless of what you're going through. You put those things in front of you like big rocks. These are the promises. And I've shared with you guys before this. There have been times in my life where I had to physically write the promises out and put them on my mirror, sticky notes. And I'd get up in the morning, I'd put my eyes on that as quick as I could because I knew if I didn't, that my mind was going to go to the unpromises. My mind was going to go to the things that, that, that weren't necessarily true. And so I had to fix my mind upon truth. And I'll be real with you, I didn't always believe some of those verses that I was reading because I couldn't match it up. I said, Lord, I, I choose to trust you. Don't know the timetable. Your word says in due season, and that can be three of the hardest words in Scripture, in due season. Well, what is that season? We don't know. There's some of you in that season right now. It may end tomorrow. It may not be for years from now. We don't know. But his promises hold true. So first of all, the promises of God. Second of all, the providence of God. Here's the second P, the providence of God. Think about this. Here is Joseph thrown into a pit, forsaken by his family. Now he's thrown into a prison, forgotten by his friends. Let me remind you again and reiterate, not for doing what was wrong, but for doing what was right. He lost his freedom because he would not compromise his purity, his integrity, his faithfulness. He was suffering for doing the right thing before God. That is hard. You're trying to live your life for the Lord. You're trying to give to the Lord. You lose your job. You're trying to lay your life down each and every day. You come home and you have a husband and wife look at you and say, I don't really love you like I used to. You're trying to live for the Lord, right? And you're trying to give him everything you have. But it seems like every time you take a step, you get knocked back three. So what must we do? Yes, we remember the promises of God, but we rest in the providence of God. Meaning what? That there's nothing that falls outside of the work of God in our lives. Let me say it again. There's nothing that falls outside of the work of God in our lives. Whether you've brought it on yourself or you had nothing to do with it. There's nothing that falls outside of the work of God in our lives. That he uses all things. If you believe it, say amen. Amen? You got to say it now. You got to believe this. If you believe that he uses all things, the good, the bad, the ugly, the painful, the hurtful, if you believe it, let me hear you say amen. 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 It's easier to say it than to believe it some days. To say, okay, I mean, even in my mistakes, God, you're over that. That my God's bigger than my good decisions and my bad decisions. That God, my God's bigger than the the seasons where I'm on top of a peak or, or whether I'm walking through a valley. That nothing is outside the work of God. That there's nothing that I can say, if this would just get fixed, well, then I could really walk with Jesus. Well, hold on. Do you don't think Jesus has something to do with this over here? And so what do you have to do? He had to remember the providence of God. And I love this. I remember a seminary professor saying this, an Old Testament professor say this. He said, you know, when all Joseph could see was the prison, you know what God saw? God saw the palace. When all Joseph could see was the pit and the prison, right? That's all he could see. That's what's physically in front of him. He didn't know the end of the story. We know the end of the story. God knew the end of the story. All Joseph could see was the pit and the prison. But what God saw was the work that he was doing in Joseph to one day raise him up to be elevated in the palace. And until God could do the work in his heart in the prison and in pit, he could not be elevated to the palace. All we see sometimes is what's in front of us. How could we not? We're human beings. We see the present moment, right? We don't know how it's going to play out. We know the promises. We believe the promises. But can we rest in the providence that God will work all things out? Romans 8, 28, right? For all things are worked out to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to believe it, especially in chaos especially in pain, especially in suffering. Can you rest in that place? That, God, you're still over this? And there's something unique you want to do in this that you could not do otherwise? I always go back, and I will always go back to the storm on the Sea of Galilee. I will always go back to that. 
And I think about, again, it was the thing that these disciples thought was going to kill them. It was the same thing that God was using to do something unique in them. They weren't there because they were being disobedient. They weren't there because they were out of God's will. They were being obedient. They were exactly where Christ told them to be. Christ is the one who sent them immediately into the storm. Why? Because there were things that he wanted to show them and do in and through them that he could not do apart from the storm. The providence of God. I remember in a youth retreat, and a guy came out, and he he brought a a birthday cake. And it was nobody's birthday that we knew of. It was an illustration. He was like, anybody want birthday cake? A bunch of teenagers, of course, yeah, we want birthday cake. And so we all ate birthday cake. And he said, okay, now we're going to do something. He said, I want to bring out all the individual ingredients of the birthday cake. Now, I've never baked a cake, so help me with this. You've got raw eggs, raw flour, sugar, milk, anchovies, what what else, (laughs) mix, I don't know. So individual ingredients. And so this is what he said. He said, okay, all you guys that were so happy to come up here and try the birthday cake, he said, now I want to invite you to come here to try the individual ingredients separately. And we're like, that's gross. What are you talking about? He said, well, let's look at it now with our lives. He said, sometimes all we do is we focus upon the individual ingredients, right? We don't see the birthday cake. We don't see the story that God is writing. We don't see the work that God is doing. When all Joseph could see was the moment God saw bigger than that. When all we can see is the moment and the pain and the suffering, our Lord sees bigger than that. And we can trust in his promises and we can rest in his providence. Here's the third one. And I believe most important. I'm going to close with this. Third P, his presence. Now this is this on the side of the cross right here. I've always been intrigued where Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you know, it'd be better for you guys if I leave. What? Like for any of us, right? If I said, okay, if you could walk beside Jesus, like physically walk beside Jesus, hear his teaching, hear his preaching, witness his healing, right? I think we would all say, man, that would take my Christian life to a whole nother level. And yet he looks to his disciples and he says, it's better for you guys for me to go to heaven. It's better for me to ascend into heaven. Because if I don't ascend, then I can't send my helper, my presence. And so rather than walking beside you, I'm going to send one who will live within you. And so let me say this in the most practical way that I can. If you find yourself in this season, yes, you rest in those promises that cannot be broken. Yes, you trust in the providence of God. But where it comes down, it comes down to your walk and your communion in the presence of God. Because the enemy is quick to pounce and to lie. So what must we do? We must be in the presence of God. We must make sure that we're clean before God. We must make sure that we're initiating our walk with God. We must make sure that we're pursuing truth, not only with our eyes, but in our hearts and our lives. We must make sure that we're taking the steps that God's word has told us to stay. Now look at this. I want you to see this. You see this repeated phrase, right? Genesis 39, 1 through 3, the Lord was with him. Genesis 39, 21 through 23, it says, and the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph the entire time, whether he was in a pit or whether he was in prison. I don't care if the enemy was telling him, you've been forsaken, you've been forgotten. No, the truth of the matter is God did not forsake him. God did not forget him. God was with him the entire time. It's a repeated story. Noah, what does the Bible say? That God was in the ark with him. The he, three Hebrew boys, right? The fiery furnace, that the presence of God was there with him. Daniel in the lion's den, that the presence of God was with him. The disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee, the Lord was with him. The Bible says what to us? To those who know Christ as their Lord and Savior, hear this and hear this in the authority of God's word. No matter how deep the water is, we will not be overtaken. No matter how hot the fire is, we will not be consumed because the promises of God's word that can't be broken are this. Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overtake you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. We rest in that promise right there. Listen, easier said than done. And I don't think it can be forgotten how Joseph responded in all this. He responded much differently than I think most of us would. Nowhere in the story do you find bitterness Nowhere in the story does it say he held a grudge. Nowhere in the story does he seek revenge. 13 years in prison. The Bible says when he became the prime minister of Egypt, basically second in charge, he never mentioned his brothers who sold him into slavery. He never said anything, at least the Bible doesn't say, about Potiphar's wife 
who falsely accused him. He never uttered a word about the butler who promised he'd remember him, but actually forgot him. What do you find Joseph doing? Just keeping on. Just keeping on with the Lord. There's freedom in that. There's freedom in that. There's freedom when you just walk in the present moment, the communion with the Father. When you say, you know what? I don't know what tomorrow will bring, and I can't control what happened yesterday. All I can control is the present moment. And in this present moment, Lord, I'm going to feed upon your truth. I'm going to rest in my fellowship with you, and I'm going to feel your embrace and the peace that surpasses understanding and the joy that fills my heart. May it be the fuel to get me through this valley, but get through this valley changed. And on the other side of this, I can look back and say, I'm not the same person. God, you did things uniquely through this situation that you could not have done. So where the rubber meets the road, it's in your daily walk with the Lord. And that only comes in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe that there are many of you walked in this morning let's be real discouraged maybe you're asking some of these same questions God I see it and I read it but I'm having a hard time matching it up in my life so in spite of my feelings and in spite of my flesh I choose to trust you to remember your promises, to rest in your providence, but man, to enjoy every second of the day your presence in my life. Listen, my day may go sideways. You have promised to never leave me nor forsake me, and I rest in that. Amen? There we have bowed and every other. I remember a professor saying this. He said, you know, what would have happened had Joseph given in at 12 years and 364 days? I remember how that hit me. What would have happened if just at the end of the journey, he would have said, you know, I tried it, God, and I tried it your way, but obviously you're not there. So you may be at the end of your rope. I don't know. I would tell you, hold on, wherever you may be. And may you take the promises that are given to us right here in front of us and quickly get to them. Quickly get to them. Get to them early. Get to them often. And watch how through the lens of God's word, even your view of your situation will change. Rather than saying, God, just get me through this. I want to get through this. I want to rush through this. No, you're going to say, Lord, I don't want to get through anything until you do the work you've done in me. It's a different approach. And we can miss the present. I know I have. We can miss the present, questioning whys of yesterday and what might be tomorrow. Always think about what Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. Enough bread just baked for the day. Lord Jesus, we'll walk through tomorrow when it comes. Listen, all these promises come down to one thing. It comes down to Christ, bottom line. As believers, it doesn't make us a better person. It makes us forgiven, redeemed, covered by the blood of Jesus. And so I just simply ask you this morning, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you placed your faith and trust in the one who came and lived a life that you could never live, that I could never live, a life of sinlessness, a life of perfection, so that he would take our place upon a sinner's cross and die as a substitute? For those of you who know him, it's a battle every day. But the victory has already been won. We're not fighting for it, but we've been called to walk in it. We invite you to stand right where you are as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you praise. And so, Lord, for many in this room, they give you praise even right now in their storm. And so, Lord, we pray that the promises that we read in Scripture, Lord, again, that you would solidify them in our hearts. Lord, whether they come true today, tomorrow, next week, next year, Lord, regardless, may you sustain us in this season. Lord, we rest in your providence. 
Lord, we don't understand, but we trust. Lord, in your presence daily, Lord, may you go before us. Walk with us, protect us, lead us, guide us. Embrace us. Because we are never alone. We give you praise for that. And for the one who conquered it, the Lord Jesus Christ. May that name be lifted high. We pray it, we ask it, and all of God's people said.